program and here we are today, this is day two of our visit to the Air and Space Museum. We're actually in Washington DC uh, on Independence Avenue uh, at the National Air and Space Museum itself. I'm joined once again by Nick Partridge. Nick is the Public Relations Specialist with the museum. And Nick has kindly uh, given up his time and we're going to look at some of the exhibits and artifacts that are actually here in the museum. We're actually just come into the main hallway just as you come through the door and certainly I, I'm certainly hit by the amount of history that's just immediately here. Nick, uh, if I could just uh, pass over to you, if you could just take us around some of the exhibits here and point out a few things. Sure, absolutely. This is the Boeing Milestones of Flight Hall. It's our central gallery. It was renovated just last summer. Since 1976, more than 300 million people have come through here, and it contains some of the most significant artifacts in the history of flight, including spaceflight. The most visually striking centerpiece there is Lunar Module 2. That is an actual lunar module. It was intended for a test flight during the Apollo program, but an earlier test flight was so successful that that was deemed unnecessary, which is lucky for us, because now it is here in our central gallery, outfitted to look as closely like Eagle from Apollo 11 as possible. Can it just be fairly, fairly identical to the actual landers that actually went to the moon? This one is slightly heavier than the landers that went to the moon. This would have been more akin to the landers that did the Earth orbit tests, but it is visually outfitted to look like Apollo 11's eagle. Now, there's quite a lot of people here, but I wonder if we could just take a trip, maybe get a closer look at it as well. Absolutely. Of course, there's a little figure there to give you a sense of perspective from just how large the lander actually is. And how long have you, have the, has the lander actually been here in the center, in the museum? Since 1976, it was in the east end of the building until just last year when we moved it here into the Boeing Milestones of Flight Hall. It was previously in the Arts and Industries building which is one of the original Smithsonian museums a little further down the National Mall here in Washington. And of course, just above it actually is another historic craft. We have the Spirit of St. Louis still up there as well. Uh, and that's what I was just saying. When you come in here, you are hit by quite a number of his historic objects and uh, exhibits. And to our right, there's actually uh, a few more from the, uh, is that Gemini and Mercury? Yes, it is. This is Gemini 4, the, uh, the horizontal spacecraft, and the vertical spacecraft next to it is Friendship 7. Gemini 4, of course, is the first mission uh, featuring an American spacewalk. Ed White spacewalked during Gemini 4, and right next to it is Friendship 7, which is John Glenn's spacecraft that he used to become the first American to orbit the Earth. Um, of course, these are the original uh, craft themselves, they're not replicas. They are absolutely the originals. They have been also here since 1976 when uh, they were transferred to the Smithsonian from NASA a few years ago. Now, I'm not sure if I can see right down at the end, we have one of the Mars landers. Is it going to get a quick look at that? Get rid of this. Nine point one million visitors between both locations. It can get crowded yes, in here. Yes, uh, yes, absolutely. This is our Viking lander. This was the backup craft for our Viking lander. Uh, Viking landed on Mars on July twentieth, nineteen seventy-six, just seven years to the day after the Apollo eleven landing. And of course, this wasn't just a model or a mock-up. This is actually used by the scientists back here on Earth. They were replicating some of the uh, experiments that were going on on Mars and see how the, the, the spacecraft would operate. Yes, uh, absolutely. This one is identical to the two landers that uh, landed on Mars in 1976. It certainly could have flown if need be. Uh, during mission planning and while the landers operated on Mars, scientists and engineers used this duplicate to model how the landers would respond to various radio commands. And 
just above us, and there's a, a maybe a more modern piece of space aircraft. If we can, there we go. What are we looking at uh, above us, Nick? That is Spaceship One, the uh, first successful commercial uh, private spacecraft. Uh, it flew two successful suborbital missions in order to win the uh, Ansari X Prize a few years ago, which was an interesting callback to the spirit of St. Louis, which was flown across the Atlantic to win a similar prize, the Ortiz Prize. Okay. And of course, that's Virgin and to Richard Branson, and that's still going ahead. Uh, they, they, I think they just done a recent test uh, in the last few months, and space tourism uh, is very much a goal for uh, Virgin Galactic, I think, in the actual organization's called. And across from that, on the other side of the room, there is an X-15, it's not just any X-15. Who actually flew that one, Nick? That is the X-15 that Neil Armstrong flew during the program. Uh, of course, the X-15 was uh, the fastest aircraft in the world in some auspices. Well, it's the fastest aircraft in the world outright. Uh, the Blackbird only gets the uh, nod if you include air-breathing jets. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to say, this is just the entrance hall. And there's one other thing, actually. If we can just scroll around on the wall, there's a, a large uh, fan. Where's that? Where's that? Where's that? That enormous fan that some people from the ground mistake for a spruce goose propeller is actually the full-scale wind tunnel fan from NASA Langley. That was the wind tunnel that NASA used to test all of the spacecraft, uh, test the design of the spacecraft for re-entry and how the dynamics would work at speed. This is actually the dynamic structural test vehicle. Uh, it was used for uh, stress tests, temperature, heat, and cold, uh, vibration tests to subject the, uh, subject the frame to what kinds of stresses it would be subject to during launch and deployment. Uh, then it was used to lay out all of the wiring harnesses and design all of the systems and kind of fit them in place before they built the actual Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, this was in use from the late 1970s through the 80s as they de designed and developed the telescope. And that just shows you how long there actually Hubble was in development for decades because it was obviously in the late 90s before it actually got up into space. Mm. So this, I mean, it is such a massive uh, exhibit. It's hard, you know, when you see pictures of Hubble, you don't really realize just how <laughs> giant a telescope it really is. Yeah, it's hard to get in frame. Yeah, yeah it really is. So I'm struggling here at the moment. Okay, so we've got Hubble there and we're moving probably a bit back again to the 70s and during the Cold War there wasn't much cooperation between the Russians and the Americans but here we have one example of it. Yes. We have an um, uh, Apollo Soyuz. Yeah this is the Apollo Soyuz test project mock-up. In July of 1975 the Soviet Union and the United States flew a joint space mission uh, which looked something like this once they met up in orbit. These are uh, test articles, both vehicles are test articles. The docking module in the center is actually the flight backup. So that is the real deal that would have gone up had the first one had any malfunction. And again, that was one of the few times both nations were able to work together, probably until the ISS came along. Okay, and just have a look here. If we swing back around to our left, there is a, a giant tank, almost sitting there. Uh, that, Nick, is Skylab, or a replica, replica Skylab? That is actually the backup Skylab. Mm -hmm. So that is, to the extent that a real space station can still be a real space station not having flown in space, that is Skylab. It would have gone up, much like the docking uh, module, had there been a malfunction with the first one. This one has, of course, been modified to sit on the stand here in the gallery and has had uh, hatchways cut into it so that our visitors can pass through and see the inner workings of the space station. Skylab was America's first space station. And uh, in another part of the museum, it's actually the command module that took the astronauts on them up and brought them back down. Hopefully we'll get a chance to look at it again. And you were saying uh, a little bit of information, Nick. You were saying that this is actually part of an what would have been a Saturn V, 
Yes, uh, the fascinating thing that I love about Skylab, without getting into too broad of a generalization, is that it was built inside of a uh, the gas tank to a moonship. Uh, the Saturn V uh, stage that would have done the last push to get astronauts and spacecraft to the moon when you are not going to the moon is not as necessary, so they built the space station inside that stage of the Saturn V rocket and used the rest of the Saturn V to push the space station into Earth orbit where it was visited by crews of three members each. I think we just one item I want to do want to look at, and it shows you just some of the battering that Hubble has gone through during its time in space. This is a this is from the camera that was removed from Hubble. Is that right, Nick? Yes. During one of the servicing missions, uh, this camera was removed from Hubble and replaced with an upgraded, more sophisticated unit. And uh, one of the interesting things is you look at it, and it looks maybe like all of these holes are where it was struck in space. And that is true, but the important thing to note is that those holes were not punched as we see them now by debris in space. NASA, before turning the camera over to us, drilled out each place on the camera that had been struck by debris so that they could study it in depth, find out uh, the shape, the forces, uh, how deep it had penetrated. So yes, those are all the places it was struck. No, all of those holes were not punched in space. Yes. But it does give a clear indication of just the punishment that uh, Hubble and as well any other satellite can go through because of the amount of debris that's floating about. It we're is in, certainly a dramatic visualization. Okay, we're in the North Park Museum, which is looking at exploring the, our own galaxy, our own solar system, and uh, our planets. We're looking at a spacecraft which is called Stardust. Nick, w w what was Stardust about? Stardust was the first U.S. space mission dedicated solely to returning extraterrestrial material from beyond the moon. Uh, it collected samples from a comet called Viold 2 and uh, interstellar dust along the way. It launched in 1999 and spent seven years in deep space before this particular portion of the spacecraft, the return module, landed in the Utah desert in 2006. Okay, and of course, there's very few uh, spacecraft that have actually gone beyond the moon, collected material, and actually returned it again to the Earth. So this is probably one of, I was going to say a handful, not even a handful of spacecraft. It's certainly the only one I can think of. I'm sure there's probably one or two others. Okay, we're just going to look at uh, two replicas of spacecraft, one from our past, and one very much from our present. What we're looking at at the moment is uh, New Horizons. Now, obviously, New Horizons, uh, just a few years ago, went to Pluto and gave us those fantastic pictures and all the data that came with it. Nick, do you have any more information about uh, New Horizons and its current mission? Yeah, it, uh, of course, was the first spacecraft to explore Pluto, and it launched in 2006. It took several years to get there. It was a three billion mile journey uh, and did return, as you said, those amazing photos of Pluto. It is now on a continuing mission to the Kuiper Belt. It uh, detected an object that was deemed worthy of study and the uh, New Horizon mission was extended to include that. It is on its way there and will reach it uh, many months from now. Yeah, so we're looking forward to seeing what New Horizons still has in store for us. Now to the left of New Horizons, and I don't think we're going to fit it all in, is just space history. Anybody who knows anything about uh, spacecraft knows, knows what this is. This is Voyager. And of course Voyager launched in the 70s and sent back some of the most amazing pictures we've actually seen of our, our uh, solar system certainly at that time. Nick, uh, if you could tell us a bit more about this. This is the full-scale mock-up of Voyager. Uh, it was used for engineering tests ahead of the launch of the actual vehicles. It is full-scale and the scale of it always surprises uh, that these spacecraft, the two spacecraft, are still out there operating to some degree, uh, including Voyager 1, which is now 17 billion, more than 17 billion miles away, and left the solar system uh, just a couple of years ago. Yeah, I was, I was going to see if I can just fit everything in, just to give me an idea of just how the size of the whole uh, spacecraft. So where is the end? If we just pan across here. Uh, the reason uh, it is, 
that particular arm is so long is because at the far end you have basically a nuclear reactor. So all the instruments, which are particularly sensitive, have been put as far away from that as possible. But you say, until you actually see the size of these, uh, you don't appreciate just how incredible they really are. Okay, we've left the spaceships and space rockets to one side for a moment, and we've come into another part of the museum. Uh, this is quite a, a historic part, uh, probably the birthplace of uh, flight. Nick, uh, where are we at the moment? We are in the Wright Brothers Gallery, and this is the 1903 Wright Flyer. This is the world's first successful powered, heavier-than-air aircraft. Okay, and uh, how much of this is the original aircraft itself? More than 80%. Uh, it was disassembled following the crash the day of the first flight in December of 1903 and uh, various parts including the cloth covering and the propellers were uh, refitted with exact accurate replicas of what did fly on that day in 1903 and of course we've got the original skin covering and propeller here in the gallery alongside of it along one wall. Mm -hmm. And of course, although it's not direct, you know, directly related to space flight, without the, this flight and others like it, we wouldn't be uh, going to the moon in just over 100 years since this.